Welcome to Bethlehem. We are so very thankful that you are joining us today, whenever you might be watching this. If you are watching it live or on the recording, welcome. If this is your first time, thank you so much for being with us. There is a link to download the bulletin in the description of the YouTube video. This has been a difficult week in the midst of a very difficult year, and so we are glad that you are here, and we hope that this time will bring some peace, help ground you. We are entering into a new season of the church year. We begin with the Thanksgiving, or we begin with um, the baptism of Jesus today, and then we are in the season after Epiphany, leading up to Ash Wednesday. So today, we are going to begin with the Thanksgiving for baptism. Named and claimed as beloved children of God, let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. Blessed are you, holy God. You, you are, are the, the creator, creator of the, the waters of the earth. earth. You, you are, are the fire of rebirth. You poured out your spirit on your people, Israel. You breathe life into our dry bones. Your son, Jesus, promised to send the spirit to us that the world may know your peace and truth. Pour out your Holy Spirit and breathe new life into each of us. Merciful God, you are the ocean, the source of all life. You are the river, saving us from death. You are the stream, restoring our community's strength. We praise your triune name, Creator, Christ, and Counselor, today, tomorrow, forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of baptism. For in those waters we are reminded that we are your beloved children and that your love is unconditional. We remember the teachings of Martin Luther who reminded us to each morning as we wash our face, remember our baptism and know that each new day is an opportunity to live into who we were created to be. We ask your help in that endeavor. We ask that you strengthen us and guide us as we do so. And we pray all these things in your son's name, the one who you named as beloved all those years ago. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
boys and girls, it is so very good to see you today. Today I am standing right by our baptismal font because today is the day that we celebrate and remember the day that Jesus was baptized. And also, we celebrate and remember the day that we were baptized. So, this is what I would like you to do. Go and get some water in a cup or a bowl. See my bowl? Go get some water from the sink or the kitchen, wherever you can. Go, go now while I get mine. All right. All right, you can pause the video while you go get it. Now that you have your water, then you take the water and you put your finger in it. Do you remember, and I think most of you may not, the day that you were baptized? If you don't remember, ask your mom or dad, because I know that they remember that day. Let me tell you what happened on that day. Your whole family was gathered your mom and your dad and your brothers and your sisters and grandmas and grandpas and probably a whole congregation. And as you were baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the pastor put finger in water and put a mark on your forehead and said you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. So you take the water that you just got and you put your finger in it, because baptism happens once in our lives. But remembering the gift of God's love in our lives happens every day. So you go to your mom and your dad, your brother, your sister, your dog, your gerbil, or your parakeet, and you mark their foreheads with the sign of the cross and say, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. And if you can't remember those words, then you say God loves you while you make that mark because it's essentially the same thing. Baptism is God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. So you go and do that. And while you're marking the cross on all of your family, I will tell you about the baptisms in my life. I was baptized in 1963 at a congregational church in Tulare, California, I have been Lutheran all my life, and for reasons that would take me longer to describe than I have right now, I was baptized Congregationalist, which I think is amazing, because there's all kinds of different ways of being church, and so I'm glad that that was my baptism. Emily was baptized on December the 18th, 1996, in Boulder, Colorado, at a Lutheran campus ministry by a Missouri Senate Lutheran pastor named Bob Stunkel. Linnea was baptized on, e on Epiphany, January 6th, which just came and went. She was baptized in Washington. Okay, have you, have you crossed everybody now? Good, I am glad to hear it. Ask your mom and dad when church is over to tell you the story of your baptism, and maybe to tell you the story of their own. As we tell each other stories, as we remember that God has loved us from the first day we took breath, and God will love us all of our lives. And because we have the sign of the cross on our foreheads, that sign, that symbol that we can't see, that carries us all the days of our life and gives us strength and hope for all the things we do. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus' baptism. We thank you for our baptism. We thank you that there's a cross on us that we cannot see, that there's a strength in us that we can feel. We thank you for your love, for us, for our families, and for the world. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. The first reading for this day comes from Genesis the first chapter. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, 
and there was morning, the first day. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of the repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all of the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you in water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. I was at my Zumba class this past Monday. For those of you that don't know, I am a huge fan of Zumba. It is an amazing workout and so much more fun than running on a treadmill. So I was at my class, and by that, I mean I was in my living room, you know, with my computer hooked up to my TV and the coffee table pushed against the wall on a Zoom call because all of our classes have gone virtual since the pandemic hit. Oh, what a world we live in. <laughs> Although Zoom Zumba does have a nice ring to it. So as we were stretching and waiting for our instructor to get all of her music lined up, I commented that this first class of the year was a little different than normal. You see, there were only four of us, including the instructor, on our call, and I distinctly remember how in past years, the first class of the year was always packed full of people that I had never seen before. It was all those New Year's resolutioners who would show up in January and then, you know, pretty much disappear by March. During worship last Sunday, I included a prayer asking God for strength to keep the resolutions that we had made and grace for the ones that we had already broken, a number that I hope has not increased too much in the past seven days. One of my New Year's resolutions this year, inspired by my fiance Alyssa, is to have one day a week where I eat no meat whatsoever. Now, all of the vegetarians out there are probably laughing, but as a proud carnivore, this is a real challenge for me. You know, even when I had the perfect opportunity a few weeks ago, on the day that I had to prep for my colonoscopy, I still failed. It should have been a slam dunk. I wasn't allowed to eat any solid food after 10 a.m., but I had a piece of pepperoni pizza for breakfast. <laughs> but that was last year. New year, new me. We'll see how that one goes. I'm starting slow, you know, like two out of three meals to start. For any of you that are attempting to make a big change this new year, I wish you the best of luck. And I hope that you have grace with yourself should you stumble or falter, because the road to real change is not a straight shot. And your resolve may need a booster shot every now and then, but each new morning is a new opportunity for success, which actually ties quite nicely into our topic for today, baptism. The baptism of Jesus is one of my favorite Bible stories, regardless of which gospel it comes from, not just because of the content of the story, but also because of where it falls in relation to the rest of the gospel narrative. Jesus is baptized before he has done one single act of public ministry. 
God names and claims him before he preached his first sermon, performed his first miracle, before he has healed anyone or called his first disciple or even cast out his first demon. He's not only named and claimed as God's son, but God's son, the beloved, with whom God is well pleased. This is one of the strongest examples that we have in scripture of what unconditional love looks like. Before Jesus has accomplished anything in his life of ministry, before he has done anything that could be construed as earning God's love and approval, God bestows it upon him as a free gift of grace. And God does the same with each and every one of us. One of the reasons that we in the Lutheran tradition baptize babies is because it is a visual reminder of this fact. We see a young innocent child at the very beginning of life bestowed with God's unconditional, all-encompassing love. A child who in no way could have possibly earned that love through word or deed. Yet that love and that grace are poured out nevertheless. That child is named and claimed as one of God's beloved children with whom God is well pleased. A gift and a mark that we all bear as well. Pastor Laura and I were discussing earlier this week what kind of opening liturgy we wanted to include for this season after Epiphany. Now, there are two basics that you can choose from, confession and forgiveness and thanksgiving for baptism. We do sometimes get tired of both of those and throw in something else, but for the most part, those are the two mainstays. We decided, given the fact that today is the celebration of Jesus' baptism and the fact that Lent— a time when we typically deal with confession and self-reflection is only five and a half weeks away. And yes, you heard me right, Lent is only five and a half weeks away, and no, I'm not ready for that yet either. (laughs) But given those facts, we decided that a Thanksgiving for baptism would be more fitting. Prior to this week, I'll admit that I didn't see much of a connection between these two liturgies. In my mind, Confession and forgiveness was something to be used in times of the church year when we needed to reflect on the broken and sinful nature of humanity, soberly acknowledge the ways that we have fallen short of God's vision for our lives, while thanksgiving for baptism carried with it a more celebratory and joyful feeling, something to be used during seasons like Easter. But as I reflected on the text for today, on my own understanding of baptism and on the events of this past week, I began to realize that these two liturgies are more closely linked than I previously thought. Rather than being two contrasting worship options, they're actually like two sides of the same coin. If you look at the Lutheran baptismal rite, or even just baptismal theology in general, you will find that we profess that we are baptized into Jesus' death and resurrection. Something that I always feel just a little weird saying, especially when we're gathered around the baptismal font with a family dressed in their Sunday best and a a bright-eyed baby, sometimes cheerfully, sometimes not so cheerfully in tow. It always seems a bit dark and dour for such a happy occasion. And it gets better, too, because what we mean when we say that we are baptized into Jesus' death and resurrection is that our old sinful selves are put to death in the waters of baptism so that we might be raised to new life in Jesus. And what's more is this is not a one-time thing. While Lutherans do not believe in re-baptizing someone, we're one and done when it comes to that, Martin Luther did believe that every time we wash our faces in the morning, we should remember our baptism because each new day is yet another opportunity for our old, sinful selves to be put to death and for us to live into the promise of who we might be, who we were created to be. And confession is an integral part of that process. Because if we thought that we were already living perfectly, then there would be no need to celebrate the fact that every day offers us a new opportunity to be better people. If we thought that we were living holy and pure lives above reproach, we'd say thanks, but no thanks. I'm doing just fine with that first chance I was given. 
part of celebrating the opportunity for a new start, a, a second chance, is acknowledging the need for it in the first place. In order for us to put our old sinful selves to death, we first need to acknowledge that we do in fact have old sinful selves. It requires acknowledging that we haven't lived in ways that we are completely proud of. I, as I'm sure many of you did as well, watched the events from this past Wednesday unfolding on my TV and in my newsfeed. I attended graduate school in Washington, DC. I used to love going down to the National Mall and just exploring. The first week that I lived there, I remember I stumbled upon a military band playing a concert on the western steps of the Capitol building. DC was also where I first felt my call to ministry. I can remember sitting with my back against a tree, this time on the east side, staring up at the rotunda of the Capitol. I just met with the Lutheran pastor of the church that is located two blocks from that historic building to talk about what following God's call might look like. And as I saw and heard the news coming in on Wednesday, my heart ached. I saw a city that I love descend into chaos. I saw acts of violence and terror being acted out on live television, perpetrated by an angry mob fueled by lies and words of hatred and division. I saw people seeking to disrupt the democratic principles and procedures upon which this nation was founded. I saw images that I usually only associate with war-torn nations halfway around the world. And I saw that picture of the Capitol ingrained in my memory from that summer afternoon so many years ago, contrasted sharply with the one that was on my television set. It was the same building. Only now it saw members of law enforcement and duly elected representatives from both sides of the aisle under attack. Their physical safety threatened their personal and professional belongings ransacked. In the days following, I saw many posts on social media struggling to make sense of it all. Some of them posting helpful insights and some less so. I saw a number of posts saying things like, this is not who we are. Now we are a vast and diverse nation with no single narrative that completely dominates who we are. But just because we do not like what we see does not mean that we can just reject it. We can and must denounce it, but that is not the same as refusing to admit that it exists. Now maybe what they really meant was that this should not be who we are, or, or that we are better than this, or we can be better than this, and I can get behind all of those statements, but part of confession means facing uncomfortable truths about ourselves. For to deny them would be to discredit and minimalize the hurt and pain that they have caused. To refuse to claim them only helps to perpetuate their power. If you're anything like me, though, my my failures, the, the times when I have fallen short, the times when I act in ways that I know are contrary to who I am, those are the moments that I most readily want to forget. I don't even want to think about them, let alone claim them. So how do we face these difficult things? Well, we face them by remembering that we are loved. We can acknowledge our shortcomings because we do so upon the sure foundation of God's love. Because we stand confident in God's unconditional love, we are given the courage to face the ways that we have not lived up to our calling as children of God. The point is not to lead us to a point of, or a place of despair, a place of defeat, because acknowledging those things does not mean that we are unworthy of or that we might lose God's love. Rather, it is a necessary and critical part of the rebirth that we are called to in our baptisms. Ours is a God of resurrection hope, a God who brings life out of death, who transforms the broken crucifixion moments of our lives into glorious Easter mornings, a God who knows we will fail, 
who knows we will fall down, who picks us up, brushes us off, and says, I love you. Go and do better next time. We must not be afraid of the ways that we have fallen short. We must face them boldly in order that we might learn and grow, striving to do better, to be better, confessing our sins while at the same time professing our faith in the one who makes all things new. Because we know that just because God loves us unconditionally, that does not mean there is no room for improvement. You can love someone unconditionally and still see ways that they could better themselves, still want something more for them. But like with any New Year's resolution, we know that this will require action on our part, conscious effort to choose love over hate, kindness and grace over rancor and fear, to build one another up rather than tear each other down, to seek justice rather than comfort, and to speak the truth in love to power rather than seeking to maintain the status quo, to promote life and joy in all that we do. Of course, we don't have to do any of this. You know, we could take God's promise and gift of unconditional love and run with it, run far away from our failures, but that would be a hollow and unfulfilling way to live. As Christians, we are called to the deeper, oftentimes more difficult path, a path that involves owning up to things that we might not want to, but not so that we stay in that place of regret and despair, immobilized by shame and guilt. We seek this new way of being in the world out of the security that comes from being named and claimed as beloved. We are called to confess our shortcomings so that we might enter into new life through the one who God claimed as beloved all of those years ago, to pass through those same waters and be reborn, to strive each and every day to be the people we were created to be. Each and every one of us is loved fully and unconditionally. The question is, how will we live as a result? Amen.
on this day when we remember the mark of baptism in our lives, we confess the faith that we share. I believe in God, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator, creator of, of heaven, heaven and earth. earth. I believe, I believe in, in Jesus Christ, Christ God's, God's only Son, Son, our Lord, who was conceived, conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was crucified, died, died and was buried. Was buried. He, he descended, descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we come into prayer this day, it is both with heavy heart and with confidence in the resurrection that I wanted you all to know that Deanie Pease, beloved member of this congregation, went to be with her Lord yesterday in the company of her daughter. Deanie died with COVID, the first death in this congregation. Um, we have been remarkably spared in this season. And also I would ask your prayers for Chico, who is a member of our congregation, his daughter, died recently as well. Her name was Julie. She had end-stage uh, metastatic cancer, but was also COVID positive. And there are so many more for whom we need pray. I would ask your prayers too today for Judy Foland, our office administrator, whose mother died in these last days as well. Therefore, there is much reason to be in prayer this day for those whose names we know and for those whose names we do not know, that guided in the covenant of our own baptism and grateful for the grace that the Lord would rain down on us on this and every day. We pray for the church, for the nation, for the earth, and for all those who are in need of grace this day. Holy Spirit, Descend on us all this day. Remind us of the covenant of our baptism and the cross traced on our foreheads. Embolden us to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. May your tender mercy drench us all this day. And may your uncommon grace find each of us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for this nation with broken hearts and for all those who are peacemakers amid strife. We pray for the safety of our congressional leaders and for all those who serve in elected office. May we commit ourselves together to seek the common good and the welfare of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our hear prayer. prayer. Healing, Lord. As this nation reaches the painful milestone of 300,000 deaths from COVID, we ask you to shower your compassion and mercy on all those who grieve loss this day. We pray for Susan and her family and all those who grieve Dini's passing and celebrate her life. We pray for Chico and his family and all those who grieve Julie's death and celebrate her life. We pray for Judy, Wayne, and Audra as they grieve the loss of Judy's mother, Carol. Use us, Lord, as instrument of, instruments of your healing in the lives of all those in pain. And hold us all in the hope of tomorrow. Both in silence and aloud, we lift to you now the names of those we know to be in particular need this day. We thank you, God, that you hold us all in your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. Lord. Merciful God, we know that you hear our prayers before they are spoken, and you rush to our aid. We pray, trusting in your mercy and love for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
Amen. And now, dear people of God, may the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also, also with you. you. Why, thank you. Please share that with everyone you know, with strangers on the street, next Wednesday when you see them, in any way that you can send peace out into this world, that I can send peace out into this world, let's do so. What, what a blessing, or who we are. In this moment, uh, what Pastor Sam and I usually do at this time is take a moment to thank you for the regular financial gifts that you give this congregation. And we wanted to do the same today, but in a, a more personal way. Um, I am grateful, deeply grateful, for the gifts that you regularly give both of your pastors in the Christmas season. Uh, the gift this year, as always, was extraordinarily gracious and generous, because that is who you are. But this year particularly, I think, when we have been so separated from one another, unable to hug and unable to hear one another's stories as we usually do. This gift has been particularly a reminder to me of the blessing that it is to be among you and to serve in this blessed community. Such a, a strong affirmation of who you are and the relationship that exists in this community of Christ. And I am, um, as is my family, so very deeply grateful for you. Thank you. I would like to echo the words of Pastor Laura. The generosity and the graciousness of the Christmas gift was, was truly overwhelming, and I am so thankful for it. And I think even more I am thankful for the blessing that this congregation has been in my life over the past years, but especially over the past nine, ten months during this very difficult time. Um, the ways that you have helped to support and uplift and help us to do the work that we so love to do. You have been integral to this process, and the ways that you have loved and cared for us throughout this, it's truly been a blessing, so thank you as well. And now let's sing together our offertory response. Thanks be to you. What a gift to gather as we do week after week at this table. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give our thanks and praise. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to come to this table certain that we have fallen short of God's glory. It is right to come to this table certain that we are beloved of God. Because in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. This is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is new covenant in my blood, and it is shed for you, and it is shed for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, Father who art, who art in, in heaven, 
hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. The table set, perhaps the table set in your home as well. If so, share the gifts of this table, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. If bread and wine are not at your table, fear not. The grace of God, the baptismal waters, have found you on this and every day. We will sing together the Lamb of God. We will be singing verses 1 and 3. As you take your leave today, just a few announcements for things coming up at Bethlehem that we are certain you'll want to know about and participate in. First of all, our annual meeting is coming up, best Sunday of the year, the annual meeting. Oh, parliamentary <laughs> procedure. Um, in addition to the glorious annual meeting that you will not want to miss, we also have a first ever Bethlehem congregation-wide Zoom worship. So we will not be having a live stream that morning. We will not be having an on-the-lawn worship that day either. The one worship opportunity that we all have together is to be on Zoom, because we're going to have to do it anyway for the annual meeting. So uh, we'll come on Zoom together. At 9 a.m., we will worship together. Around about 10 o'clock, we will move into the annual meeting. And I understand that Zoom fatigue is a real thing, but this worship service is going to be so much fun. <laughs> and in addition to that, um, the congregational meeting, uh, we need your voice, we need your vote, we need your presence. Uh, we need to reach a quorum on that day so that we can vote a congregational budget and elect members to our council and hear about probably the most extraordinary year we've all lived through. So please come. We would love to have you with us for both opportunities. Um, Zoom links and information about that service will be coming to you through the e-blast. If you are not signed up for our e-blast, please go ahead and do that ahead of the annual meeting. You can go to our website, go into the news and information section, um, find where you can sign up for that newsletter and you'll get all the e-blasts. Um, in addition to that, if you don't have a Zoom account, and if you don't, God bless you. If you don't have a <laughs> Zoom account, <laughs> um, you have a couple of weeks, that has to be downloaded either onto your uh, desktop, laptop, onto your tablet, onto your smartphone. So uh, download that. So we've got a couple of weeks and we'll send you the Zoom link. And if you need help learning how to use that, by all means, give us a call. We have lots of tech people in this congregation who'd be happy to walk you through it. Uh, it would be ideal if every voting member was on a different device. We know that's not always gonna be possible. So if you can be on separate devices in your home, that'd be great. If you need to be on one device, we can work with that as well. We just love to have you come. Another educational opportunity coming for you beginning January 19th. Uh, Ron and Sue Dwyer Voss, who are members of this congregation, will be leading a three, potentially four week study. The title is Acting Out Our Faith. And it'll be a wonderful opportunity to be in greater and greater conversation about the issues of race in our day. We would love to have you come and be a part of that. Also, 
Um, this is about the time of year when we would begin to set up our interface shelter. We are a part of the interface shelter network, and every year we, together with other congregations and synagogues and mosques, work together to house people who are homeless in our community. Clearly, under COVID restrictions, that's not going to be possible. What we are going to be able to do and what we'd like to ask your help with is we are gathering financial resources and the Interface Shelter Network will be paying for hotel rooms for those who are without homes. And you'll be getting an e-blast about that with some details, but if you are able to contribute to that effort so that um, families, we get a lot of children, families and children um, and individuals as well can be housed in this most difficult year. We would much appreciate it, so watch for information on that as well. I believe that's the end of announcements, and now for a blessing. Dear people of God, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord look down with favor upon you. May the Lord grant you, grant us all his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Our closing hymn is, This Day is Fun, It's Down to the River to Pray. The first verse, we're going to sing Sisters, as is written in your bulletin. And then if you look down in the small type, there's some others. We're going Sisters, Brothers, People, for verse 3. Please join us. Dear people of God, go in peace. Be the light of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God.